I'm going to talk about the, the work I've been doing on restoration issues in San Francisco Bay. Um, and just to orient you, this is an image of San Francisco Bay and Venice Lagoon on the same scale. So you can see that San Francisco Bay is just a little bit larger than Venice Lagoon, but there's a lot of similarities between the two systems. I'm not going to talk specifically about Venice. I'm going to try to give a lot of examples of San Francisco Bay and some lessons about what we've learned in restoration in San Francisco Bay that might be applicable here in, in the lagoon. So if we think about similarities between the two systems, um, they're both large coastal systems. San Francisco Bay is the largest estuary or the largest place where fresh water and salt water mix on the Pacific coast of the US. And Venice Lagoon is the largest lagoon. Um, I think it's the largest lagoon in the Mediterranean, certainly the largest lagoon in all of Italy. Um, so they're both pretty, very, very significant systems. We, they both have Mediterranean climates. And um, San Francisco, um, we, we get probably significantly less rainfall than here in, um, in Venice. We get about, let's see if I can convert, about 70 to, about 70 centimeters um, 60 or 70 centimeters of rain in a year. So we, we're, it's, it's a relatively dry system. And because of that, we have pretty salty soils. So there's a significant amount of salt accumulation from the marine waters. And so we have plants that are actually very similar. If you were to go out on a salt marsh in Venice Lagoon and one in San Francisco Bay, um, they, they look very, very similar. Um, in terms of the plants and many other dynamics. And then in terms of impacts, both of them have had a history of significant human impacts. And I'll show you some of the impacts around San Francisco Bay in just a bit. And they also have many areas that have sunk or subsided. And obviously everyone is aware of the challenges around Venice with uh, Aqua Alta and the significant flooding. San Francisco Bay also, especially in the South Bay here, uh, this is the city of San Jose and that area. And then up here where the, the freshwater rivers come into the bay, the Sacramento River and the San Joaquin River, many areas there have been diked off for over 100 years and they've, water has been pumped out, so they've consolidated, just very similar to what's happened in areas around Venice. And some of those areas have sunk anywhere from 50 centimeters to over two meters. Um, so there's concerns about flooding in San Francisco as well. In terms of differences, San Francisco is, is um, significantly larger. There's a, a, um, it's deeper, especially in the central part of the um, lagoon. There's a lot more uh, ocean water that comes in and out of the lagoon. Venice Lagoon is significantly shallower on average than San Francisco Bay, although they're both, San Francisco still also is, is dominated by pretty shallow water. The majority of the bay is less than 10 meters deep. There's more fresh water and there's more sediment coming into San Francisco Bay. And you'll see that that has important implications for restoration issues within the bay, especially all of the sediment that comes down and, and helps to build wetlands there. And um, the tidal ranges are different. Our tidal range is about two meters on average between high and low tides. So we have a lot, a, a wide, um, a large flow of water that comes in and out of the system. And then San Francisco is very urban. There's the city of San Francisco, the city of San Jose, and all the other, the, the, what's called the Silicon Valley, and then um, dense urbanization all up the east side of the bay. Um, but Venice has a much longer history of impacts. Um, at the, the San Francisco Bay up until 150 years ago really was co pr pretty much completely pristine. So that gives you some context in terms of the, what can be learned, I think, what some of the similarities and differences are between the two systems. So what I'm going to do is talk about wetlands in general, introduce you to the, the importance of wetland habitats, talk about restoration and um, climate change issues related to wetlands, and then talk about some examples from San Francisco Bay and the lessons that we can learn um, from San Francisco Bay. So as I'm going through, if there are questions, if, if I start to lose you, feel free to ask um, questions so we stay on track. So just to introduce you to wetland issues in general, wetlands are areas that are on the border between aquatic water-based systems and land-based or terrestrial systems. So this is a salt marsh on the edge of San Francisco Bay. The tides come in and out, so it's, they're, they're frequently inundated. They're, 
They're not so wet that they're always underwater, but they're not completely dry, and that makes them very different than um, tr terrestrial or dry ecosystems around the world. So we find wetlands all around the edge of the ocean and estuaries and bays all around the world. We find wetlands along the edges of river systems, and we find wetlands along the edges of ponds or big lakes. Anywhere where there's water around the edge, we'll find wetland ecosystems. And wetlands really are unique um, because of that, where they're found right at the border between aquatic and terrestrial systems. Water moves through the watershed or through the drainages um, into these systems, and it carries nutrients and pollutants and other material. So there's very unique conditions and opportunities that I'll talk about in just a second um, in terms of their location. Because of where they are, they've also been severely impacted. They're, right, uh, they're perfect places for farming, they're per perfect places for building cities, they're perfect places for building airports. So they, they've been impacted um, for all sorts of reasons. <clears throat> um, in terms of their ecology or their chemistry, the water that floods them makes the soil chemistry completely different. I'm not gonna go into soil chemistry, but um, they're, they're completely different. The, the, the way that nutrients cycle through wetlands is um, completely different, and it has important implications for um, so, some of the, um, the things, the ecosystem functions and benefits. Some of the reasons we value and benefit wetlands come from the unique chemistry that they have. And all that is related to the fact that when they're flooded, there's no oxygen in the soil. So if, if you learn anything in terms of the science of wetlands from today's talk, remember that wetlands are unique and different and it's because they're flooded and they lack oxygen. And that changes the chemistry and just makes for completely different ecosystems. And then I also, then I already mentioned the idea of this connectivity because of where they are in the landscape, right on the edge of the watershed, right on the edge of the water. And so material moves through them, the water and the nutrients and the sediments. Animals move through them as well, and so they're, they're sort of, they, they provide an important connection or passageway for other ecosystems. <clears throat> okay, so, so um, having introduced the wetlands then, really what I want, one important thing to think about is these benefits that wetlands provide. And ecologists and more and more economists are using the idea of this term of ecosystem goods and services. Those are the benefits that ecosystems provide that we as humans value. The goods are the things that we consume, that we use, and the services are the processes where we don't actually consume something directly, but we receive some significant benefit. And I'll show you an illustration of, a, of some of the critical ecosystem goods and services that um, wetlands provide. So the first thing is, because of their location within the watershed and as the water moves down through them, they significantly reduce flooding. In the US, um, no one really, the general public wasn't aware of these issues until recently when we had two significant storms, Katrina that hit New Orleans and Superstorm Sandy that hit the East Coast. And both of them, when those occurred, people realized how important the buffer of having vegetation and having wetlands on the coast provides to slow the water down. Similarly, in a watershed, as water comes down and flows into rivers, wetlands along rivers can have significant benefits in terms of reducing flooding downstream. And a number of studies have shown in watersheds that have wetlands, you have significantly reduced um, flooding impacts compared to those where all the wetlands have been filled and are lost. So that's one really valuable impact or valuable benefit they provide. As the water moves through these wetlands, it carries sediment and nutrients and pollutants. When it, when it goes through the wetland, the vegetation slows the water down and a lot of the sediment drops out. Most of the nutrients and, and contaminants are associated with those sediments and they drop to the bottom and accumulate in the wetland. So the water that flows, into the, or that flows out of the wetland is significantly improved in terms of water quality compared to the water that flows in. On top of that physical process, the biogeochemical processes, the lack of oxygen affects especially nitrogen cycling, and wetlands are extremely efficient at removing nitrogen. Um, so that's, so they, they, they significantly improve water quality. They do it so well that many wetlands, but they, they're so effective at removing nutrients that they're used to treat wastewater 
um, in many different societies in many different places around the world. So, so they're really, really, uh, that's one of the most valuable functions that wetlands provide is improving water quality. As the sediment and nutrient accumulates in these wetlands, it makes for very fertile soils. Like I said, many wetlands have been drained and used for agriculture. That's because they have very productive soils. And um, the, so natural wetlands also have very high levels of primary productivity or plant growth. High levels of nutrients, high levels of plant growth. And all of that production that occurs, a significant amount of it accumulates in the soil. And I'll explain um, in one of the later slides this idea of carbon sequestration. But th these are um, bricks, sorry, excuse me. Th th these are bricks of peat that have been harvested from a wetland in Scotland. And that there they use the peat, they burn, they dry and burn the peat uh, for fuel. Um, unfortunately, that's not at all a sustainable use of a wetland because it takes thousands of years for that soil to accumulate. Um, but that carbon sequestration is an important process in terms of global carbon cycling, in terms of reducing um, climate change and taking the carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it back into the soil. All of that productivity that occurs, not a significant amount of it accumulates in the soil and carbon. A significant amount of it also goes into the food chain um, and provides for um, important fisheries productivity uh, adjacent to wetlands. There was a, a study that was done in Louisiana and a, a number in the US where they showed a strong correlation between the acreages of wetlands and the productivity of coastal fish fisheries. I'm sure here in Venice, everyone is aware of the connection of the lagoon to the local fisheries, and it's all that productivity within the lagoon, and primarily in a significant part within wetlands, that fuels the, um, the productivity within the um, fisheries. Many traditional cultures harvest large amounts of those resources. This is a picture actually from the Iraqi wetlands at the Tigris-Euphrates River, where there were um, large, communities that lived within wetlands there prior to the bombing and the impacts within the, the, those areas. But um, they harvested plants, built all of their structures directly out of plants, and also lived off of the food and um, productivity of the wetland. And then lastly, um, in addition to being highly productive and producing resources, wetlands have a wide range of biodiversity, wide range of plant and animal species that live within those wetlands. And also because many of those areas have been impacted and reduced in size, many of those plants and animals are threatened or endangered. And so um, protecting those habitats goes a long way towards protecting the biodiversity, the unusual species. And this is a rare species, a rare bird, the clapper rail, that's found in California wetlands and a rare plant the um, salt marsh bird's beak, both of that are protected under the Endangered Species Act and that have important implications for the protection and management of, of wetlands into the future. So um, given all of those benefits that wetlands provide, Joy Zedler, a colleague of mine who's now at the University of Wisconsin, she wanted to see how important really are wetlands compared to other ecosystems. She took data from a study that had been done um, uh, to, to estimate the value of ecosystem services across the entire planet. She sorted out those benefits that came from wetland systems versus non-wetland systems. And um, so all of these different benefits here come from this first study that was done. Things like water regulation or water supply, flood protection like we talked about, nutrient cycling and improving water quality, biodiversity, um, all those things that we talked about, providing food or, or resources. You can see that the big values actually are water, treat, water quality and flood protection. But she summed all those up and she compared them to the global ecosystem services and what she found was that ecos wetlands provide 39% or 40% of all of the economic benefits of ecosystems around the world. And as you'll see on one of the next slides, Wetlands make up about 9 or 10 percent of the area of the terrestrial area of the globe. So they're providing enormous services compared to um, other sorts of terrestrial ecosystems. So 
people have realized that wetlands really provide a lot of benefits. Historically, they haven't been valued at all. They've been se severely degraded and impacted. And this is just uh, a number of English words, and I'm sure in Italian they're similar words, that are associated with wetlands that have negative connotations and all kinds of descriptions of the problems of wetlands. Um, part of those, I think, a big part of the negative connotation of wet, negative association of wetlands is that they're difficult to get around in. In aquatic systems, you can move around in a boat. Terrestrial systems, you can walk around. Wetland systems, you sink in the mud and you get trapped. Um, or the vegetation is very d dense, and so it's really difficult to get around. So we haven't really valued them at all. In the U.S., we have the creature from the Black Lagoon, the comic hero who uh, comes from an evil lagoon. We also have Swamp Thing. Um, swamp Thing is interesting because Swamp Thing was a, you know, an evil, scary character. But about 15 years ago, the EPA um, adopted Swamp Thing, the Environmental Protection Agency in the US, and used Swamp Thing as a tool to educate kids and to make kids realize wetlands actually are pretty good ecosystems. And there's good, there's good reasons to protect them. And, and I'd say, <coughs> um, actually, I know here in Venice from People I've met, there's, there's, people really do value the lagoon significantly and, and value um, wetlands. In the US, there's definitely been a change of opinion in the last 20 years, and wetlands receive a lot of protection, both legally as well as culturally, compared to 20 years ago or 30 years ago. But still, we've done enormous damage to wetlands. And just as an example, this is an image on the left of where wetlands used to occur around San Francisco Bay. All of the green area are tidal wetlands. So, to orient you, here's the city of San Francisco. Again, here's uh, San Jose and the Silicon Valley and the city of Oakland and Berkeley and the North Bay, the Napa Valley, and other regions. You can see huge acreages of wetlands around the bay. Hardly any green left. Um, California has the um, unfortunate recognition as being the state in the US with the highest level of wetland loss anywhere in the country. It, we, we've lost about 90 to 95 percent of the wetlands in California because we have high population levels and we have intense agricultural use. And those two things together have led to significant impacts. In, within San Francisco Bay and the South Bay, salt ponds that I'll show you in some of the future slides, many areas that were wetlands were diked off for salt production back about 70 to 100 years ago. In the North Bay, they were converted to agriculture. Uh, the lower part of the Napa Valley is all um, the, where, where we grow significant grapes for, for wine. Uh, our, a lot of that area is former wetlands. And then in this area, they were diked off and they're used for duck hunting, where they're still wetlands, but the water is managed and they're privately owned and they're specifically, the water levels are controlled specifically to, um, to maximize duck populations and to promote duck hunting similar to the Valle de Pesca that's on the east side of, of, um, of Venice Lagoon. So, we, we, like I said, in California, we, we've lost 90% of our wetlands. Globally, about 50% of the wetlands around the world have been lost. In the U.S., about 50% on our, across the entire continental U.S. have been lost. And like I said, agriculture is globally is by far the biggest impact. Wetlands, like I said, have, have very productive soils, and so they've been severely impacted around the world. Now they cover about 9% of the terrestrial area or land-based area of the globe, about 3% of the entire globe. So they used to be significantly more, but even, even though there's, there's not that much left, they, like we said earlier, they still are providing a lot of substantial benefits. Okay, so um, now I want to talk just a little bit about climate change and how, what climate change might mean for um, wetlands before we get into some of the specific issues within San Francisco Bay. Because climate change, for tidal wetlands, for wetlands that are on the edge of the ocean, climate change is going to have dramatic impacts. <clears throat> climate change is being driven primarily by increases in CO2 level. That's going to change plant productivity potentially. It's, it, it's causing an increase in global temperatures. For wetlands, for tidal wetlands, what that, the big factor that's going to change is sea level. And I'll show some, so some slides to illustrate that in just a second. 
And then also changes in precipitation and rainfall are going to lead to changes in salinity that could have significant impacts because wetland plants are very sensitive to um, salinity changes. So sea level or water level I think is probably the most important thing that will affect tidal wetlands. And wetlands are right on the edge of the, tie, of the lagoon or the bay and they're very sensitive to water level. This is just a time lapse of the tide coming in and the tide going out on wetlands around San Francisco Bay. If they were 10 or 15 centimeters lower, they'd be flooded a whole lot more, and they, um, the plants may not be able to grow so well. So a small change in elevation, whether it's increasing water or lowering land level, is going to have significant effects on wetlands. And this little diagram just illustrates that, that it's the um, relative elevation of the land to the water that's most important in determining whether or not plants grow there and what types of plants. As sea level rises, it, it really is a net drop in the elevation of the land. And that can be counteracted by accumulations of sediment, whether it's sediment coming in in the water, mineral material or um, soil sediment coming in from the water and accumulating. If that builds up at the same level of sea level, the plants will do just fine. And for the most part, that's what most tidal wetlands have been doing for the last few centuries or a few thousands of years. They also can accumulate organic material. That's what OM stands for, organic matter accumulation. Or the, as the roots and plant material grows, that also builds up the soil and the elevation. So sediment or organic matter both can counteract that. The big question is, how much can they tolerate? How can they keep pace as sea level starts rising more rapidly. And this is a prediction of sea level from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, from their previous report back in 2007. Currently, sea level is rising about two or three millimeters per year, um, or about 20 centimeters over a century. Their predictions at that time were about 30, well, you can see the gray area. So they predicted anywhere from 20 current conditions up to 60 centimeters or maybe even 80 centimeters by the end of the next cent this century. <clears throat> Admittedly, though, they didn't include the, potentially the most important factors in their estimate. At that time in 2006 or 7, there was very little data on melting ice sheets. And so rather than make a guess, and potentially be wrong, they just said, okay, we're going to exclude those from our estimate. We know that we're estimating low, but we're going to exclude them. So they acknowledged that their estimates were significantly low. Now, most people think rather than their, their sort of average estimate was around 30 to 40 centimeters. Most people are saying now somewhere between 60 and 80 or centimeters or a meter is very likely and potentially 1.2 meters or 1.5 meters is actually possible, which would have dramatic impacts on Venice Lagoon, on, on pretty much every coastal area around the world. <clears throat> Hopefully we start to take coastal climate change seriously and we, and we do some things to slow down that sea level rise. Because if it's 1.5 meters, I think it'll, it'll, it'll have catastrophic effects. Um, so this is just a little cartoon to illustrate that um, there will be, not a, climate change is gonna have dramatic negative impacts. Some, some species are actually going to do perfectly well. Some things, some organisms are going to benefit and do, um, do just fine from climate change. But there's going to be dramatic and rapid shifts all around the world. So for wetlands, like we said, it's really sea level rise that's most important. And um, this shows you an illustration of sea level rise over the last 10,000 years. From 10,000 years to about six or 7,000 years ago, sea level rise was actually very steep and very rapid, and there were no wetlands that accumulated. We didn't, there, are, there aren't coastal wetlands around the world that are older than 6,000 years. But about six or 7,000 years ago, sea level slowed down, started rising more gradually because of changes in climate, and wetlands kept pace, and they built up. And so most of the wetlands around the world on the coast are a few thousand years old, two or 3,000 years old, um, as they, and they've, they've, they've kept pace over time. The big question is, how steep is that increase going to be into the future? And if it's super steep, 
Is it going to rise so quickly that the plants don't keep pace again and they die out and we start to lose them? So no one knows exactly how steep that's going to be and exactly how much wetlands can tolerate. But if we look at what a range of work that's been done around the world, if it's at the low end, currently wetlands do just fine. They keep pace. If it increases maybe three to four, maybe even five millimeters per year, probably in most places wetlands will do fine. Many wetlands accumulate that much sediment. Most wetlands accumulate about two or three or four or five millimeters per year. They keep pace with sea level, maybe slightly more, but they're not accumulating dramatically more than the rate of sea level rise. If we're getting close to a centimeter or 10 millimeters per year, um, that's really when most, th there, there are some places around the world where the land is sinking at that rate, in most of those places, in the US, there's been a lot of work in Louisiana and Chesapeake Bay where there's places where the land is sinking almost 10 millimeters per year or something close to that. In most of those places, the wetlands don't keep pace. They are slowly losing elevation and starting to really convert to um, open water. And then above 10 millimeters per year, there's very few examples anywhere in the world where wetlands can tolerate much more than that unless there's enormous amounts of sediment coming in, um, building those wetlands up. So that's just a, a ballpark estimate. Um, and <laughs> illustrates how important sea level rise is likely to be. And then the other important thing is, is salinity, because like we said, if precipitation changes and freshwater runoff changes, what that is going to do is it's going to change the distribution of wetlands within um, coastal systems. In San Francisco Bay, currently there's salt marshes, Salt, very salt-tolerant plants in the central part of the bay. Here the salinity is about um, less than half that of seawater in the brackish marshes. And we get a whole different community of plants. And then there's large freshwater inputs here from the Sacramento River and another river that reduce salinity enough that there's almost no salt in this area. And so beyond these islands here, it's almost all freshwater marshes. The predictions are that the salinity is going to increase within the bay. So then the, most likely things are going to migrate. The real impact for the bay on overall thinking about big systems is that freshwater marshes are more productive and more diverse, many more species of plants than either of these other two systems. And as things get saltier, we're going to lose our diverse systems and lose our productive systems. And obviously, that could have some potential negative impacts. Like I said, there will be winners and losers. Salt marshes will actually increase, so salt marshes could, um, assuming they can keep pace with sea level rise, the change in salinity wouldn't be such a negative thing for them. Okay, so that's, that um, sort of gets you oriented, and now I want to talk more about more specifics within San Francisco Bay. Thinking about climate, climate change definitely is going to impact natural wetlands like this one. The other thing is to think about how is it going to impact, how are we going to restore systems in the context of climate change, and what does that mean? Um, and how do we go about um, restoration, given how much we've lost and how much interest there is in restoration. In San Francisco Bay, um, because we've lost so much and because there's a lot of uh, public awareness, growing public awareness of the value of wetlands, we're putting enormous effort into restoring wetlands around the bay. This is a picture of the salt ponds. It, next time, if, in, it, how many people have visited San Francisco Bay? So next time you come into San Francisco Bay, when you fly in, look out the window and look at all the, um, uh, just, just from San Jose north, there's these crazy colored ponds. The, this is a natural r red color to the pond. It's so salty that these very unusual um, plankton live in it, and, and it gives them these, this unusual red color. And there's, there's a whole crazy mix of colors, some yellow, some bright green. Um, but all of these areas in the South Bay are the salt ponds. And those are the, that's the area where there's um, significant interest in restoring wetlands, one of the areas. <clears throat> the state of California, the federal government, and a number of um, nonprofit organizations just spent in um, about 10, just about 10 years ago, spent $100 million purchasing 8,000 hectares of those salt ponds. And the plan is that over the next 20 to 50 years, they will be restored back to more natural systems. It's the largest restoration project on the, east, on, the, on the west coast and probably one of the three or four largest restoration projects in all of the US. So it's really um, an enormous effort. 
And I think what's interesting about it is that um, the way the process is going forward. So this illustrates um, the, the areas in blue and green are all slated, have all been purchased. These ponds are still being used for salt production. Although eventually I think they probably will be converted to, future, to additional restoration as well. But it's, it's they're, they're enormous areas. The, the largest previous project in the San Francisco Bay was about 50 hectares. So you can see we went from 50 hectares to thousands of hectares. Um, enormous um, leap. In terms of, one important thing in terms of doing a restoration project that's like this, first, the first thing is to set the goals to try to identify what you want to achieve with the uh, project. The, the, the key focus in, protect, in this restoration really has been on the, the first item here, providing for a mix of habitats. Restore, considering that there are so many endangered species associated with wetlands in the bay, providing habitat for endangered species, and, and providing a mix of habitats, not just salt marshes, but a whole wide range of habitats around the bay. They, they don't, they can't just, um, if, if, the simple thing to do, each of these lines all around the ponds is, is a levee that protects the pond from water. So the simple thing to do would be to just knock down all the levees and let, let the tide come back in. You can't do that because if you did, you'd increase flooding all around the bay. And so one of the big challenges is how do we do all this restoration without increasing flooding? And, um, and then second, or lastly, thirdly, um, we want to try to encourage public awareness and use of these areas. So they're being designed in a way to promote restoration or promote recreation and use of the areas. Things like kayaking and um, bird watching and fishing. There's actually still active hunting within the bay as well. So all of those um, uses are going to be promoted. <clears throat> when, they, when the groups that are involved in this restoration first set out to do it, they identified those goals. And then they thought about, well, what, are the cha what, what, what don't we really know? What, what limits our ability to restore these areas? And they, they identified all of the uncertainties, the things we don't really know, that we need to understand better in order to more effectively restore them. And um, right at the top of the list was sediment availability. S many of these areas have sunk. They're anywhere from 20 centimeters to well over a meter below their historic elevation. If we open them up now, they're not going to have plants growing in them because they're flooded so much. They have to build up elevation. In order to build elevation, they need sediment. So understanding how quickly does sediment accumulate, how much sediment is available within the bay, to, 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 is there enough to promote restoration of those large areas? That was one question. Then some of the other issues relate to contamination of mercury um, that's associated with gold mining within the bay. One of the real big questions was what what are the different kinds of habitats and how should we mix them up? Many people said we should go back to what we had historically. Other people said, well, climate change is changing things. And all the existing ponds actually have huge bird use. If we wipe out all the ponds, we're going to lose all of those existing birds. So there's been a lot of debate about how to come up with that mix. And I'll show you in a second what they've been doing to deal with that. And then some other issues are invasive species and other impacts to water quality besides mercury contamination, the dissolved oxygen levels and nutrient levels within the water. The approach, given that there are all these uncertainties, we don't know exactly what to do. There's a term that people use in the US of adaptive management. Really, the idea is taking the scientific method, testing things, um, as we go, and using it in management. Having very specific goals and evaluating as we go forward step by step, are we meeting those goals? And if we aren't meeting those goals, what's preventing us from meeting those goals and how do we adjust those things? Although it seems pretty uh, common sense, in the past most restoration people have just gone out and done what they thought would work and then moved on to the next project and we rarely learn from our, uh, either our successes or our mistakes. So the idea of adaptive management is to try things in a, in a somewhat controlled way, monitor intensively, and learn so that the next time we do something, we do it better. And um, especially with the mix of habitats, like I said, no one really knows what the best mix is. So people have identified that somewhere between a 50-50 mix 
and a probably 75-25 mix is, is most likely what we want, where we want to go. But rather than set a target now, what they said was, let's start restoring and, and every five to 10 years we'll reevaluate and we'll see how many birds are using the different kinds of habitats and, and adjust that target as we go forward. And that, that was pretty unique for such a large project to have that sort of flexibility and that sort of monitoring and incorporation of science. Um, and it really required that the project be phased. We can't go out and restore everything at once. We have to do it slowly. Luckily, we have no money. So there's, there's, no, there's no opportunity now to do it all immediately. And it's going to be phased no matter what. Probably it's going to be phased even slower than we'd really like to. And it probably will be 50 years or more before all the restoration takes place. OK, so one of the uncertainties was sediment availability. And that's some of the work I've been doing is to try to evaluate how much sediment there is, and I'll, so I'll just show you some examples of some of the data we've collected to address um, this issue of sediment availability. And like I said, this was down in the South Bay. They, the first ponds that were restored, they call the island ponds, um, because they're right here in between two major creeks. And you can see all the crazy colors of the salt ponds at, at, in, in this area. Um, they, were, they were breached in 2006, so about seven years ago. We monitored them very intensively over three years. And um, this, is, this is what the salt pond looked like. It, it, it actually, so if you went back 150 years ago, there was a marsh here. And then it was diked off and used for salt production for about 70 or 80 years. And um, <clears throat> a dense layer of gypsum developed. Gypsum is calcium sulfate, a salt that naturally occurs in seawater and that precipitates out when they're, do it, when they're precipitating out sodium chloride for typical salt use. It accumulates on the bottom of the soil, and, and it formed a dense layer, probably about 20 to 25 centimeters thick. We thought we'd just go out and break it apart, and that we, it would be important to break it apart so that plants could grow through it. Um, but we went out with sledgehammers, and it took about um, 30 minutes to knock a hole about this big. And so we quickly realized we, we weren't going to break up all of the gypsum. Luckily, enough sediment accumulated on the surface that that hasn't been an issue. But um, we did break holes in it so that we could put these posts in place. And then we went back and we measured how quickly the posts were being buried as sediment came in. And it's a crude way to measure sediment accumulation, but a lot of sediment accumulated, as you'll see in just a second. So we put these in across the, uh, densely across the site, every, almost every 100 meters. And the, the, the bigger the dot here, the, um, the greater the amount of sediment. If you can read the numbers there, there are two, from about 150 to 300 in this lower area, and around 100 to 150, as low as 10 or 20 up in this area. And that's total millimeters over three years. Remember, tidal marshes accumulate two or three millimeters per year. So these accumulated hundreds of millimeters over a three-year period very rapid rates of accumulation. San Francisco Bay, luckily, does have a lot of sediment. And especially because these areas are lower in elevation, they get flooded a lot, and they do accumulate very rapidly, much more rapidly than anyone thought. So this, um, we broke the site up into the northern area up here and the southern area. The southern area was closer to where the, these are where the um, tide comes into the site. And they were also were slightly lower in elevation. And as you'd expect, they had much higher rates of accumulation. They accumulated about 20 centimeters or 200 meters of material over three years. Compared to a natural salt marsh would have accumulated about 10. Um, and even the slightly higher elevation sites accumulated um, 50 centimeters over a three year period. So they, they, they're accumulating very rapidly. There is a significant amount of sediment available in the South Bay. We put out these little, um, Discs, uh, rubber discs, over a two-week series of high and low tides to also measure over the short term how much accumulated. And that's um, sediment over two weeks. So unbelievably rapid. Everyone within the bay was shocked um, that th these had accumulated so quickly. People were expecting somewhere between five to 10 years for enough sediment to accumulate for plants to establish. Within two years, there was pretty rapid plant accumulation. And um, within three years, dense vegetation. We were back, I was actually back there about two weeks before I came to Venice, um, in, right at the end of December. And um, 
probably three quarters of the site is, it looks almost like a natural marsh. Very, very dense vegetation accumulated. And I like this picture, it's um, aerial photographs that were taken from a kite. Um, a, a colleague at UC Berkeley, he f flies these really sophisticated high elevation kites with a gyroscope on them so the camera stays stable. And then he can lower the camera down very close to the ground and take these high resolution images. So this is um, just a little over a year apart and you can see how much vegetation came in. It looks like a mangrove forest with dense trees, but actually each of those plants is about this big and about this tall. So it's, uh, it's just very, very high resolution. Okay, so from the salt ponds we learned that <coughs> if, if we are gonna counteract sea level rise, we do want to accumulate elevation. We want to build up marshes as quickly as possible. The sooner we restore them, the more, they're going to, the more quickly they're going to build elevation. If we wait 50 years from now, they're going to be that much farther under the sea level. And, um, and sea level rise will be that much more quick uh, by that time, so it'll be even more of a challenge to restore them. So the sooner we do it, the better. In terms of the process, the way that they incorporated science and management and really used this idea of adaptive management is really super useful and valuable and, and something that could be applied to almost any sort of project. And then also science takes time. Getting this information took three or four or five years and it also takes significant funding. Um, and to address all these various uncertainties, there's a, a real challenge and at least in the U.S., there's a lot more interest in funding projects, going out and breaking down dikes and doing restoration than there is in doing science. So as a scientist, I'm, we're, we're, our, you know, our group is always trying to say, if you want to do this sort of management and incorporate science, it, it's a little more expensive, but in the long run, we learn from it, so it's useful. So um, <clears throat> then the other example is to think about bigger scale issues. That, that, that's a pretty small scale example. If we really want to address some big issues in California, things like water policy or climate change on a big scale, we, we need to do the same thing, incorporate science into our decision making process. But it's much more challenging um, on a big scale and there really aren't any good examples. Although the, I think the salt ponds is a great example on a relatively small scale. There aren't any good examples on a big scale of how science has been incorporated into um, that sort of decision making yet. Hopefully in the future we'll move in that direction. One, one sort of small scale example is the issue of carbon trading, another research project I've been involved with. Something that in the EU, has, we're, we're way behind on in, in the US, but California recently passed a law, started a carbon trading program, and so we, people realize we're, we're gonna be awarding credits for carbon People realize we don't have any idea how many, we know wetlands accumulate carbon, but we don't have any idea how, many, how, much, how well they do that and how many credits to assign them. So um, we were asked to do a project to measure carbon accumulation so that there would be a baseline for credits. <coughs> um, I mentioned that wetlands are very productive. Because they're anaerobic, because there's not much oxygen, the decomposition rates are very slow. So significant amounts of carbon accumulate below ground, whether it's in a peat bog or in a tidal marsh. They're very, very effective at accumulating carbon. I'll show you a slide in a sec, but they're, they're one of the most effective ecosystems in the world that are, at accumulating carbon. And this is just a soil core with some roots in it that are some of the carbon that is accumulating within the soil. So we collected these cores, sediment cores, we, about 50 centimeters deep and 15 centimeters in diameter. We looked at soil characteristics with depth, how much carbon is in the soil. We used some isotopic measurements to date the soil and figure out how old it is, going back about 100 years. And if anyone's interested, I'd be happy to tell you more about those details. But <clears throat> looking at soil characteristics, we dated them and we, we, co we collected about, a about 50 cores like this. Um, all around the bay to see how it varied around the bay. What we found was that about 100 grams of carbon per square meter per year is accumulating. And 100 grams of carbon per square meter is the equivalent of about 3.7 tons of CO2 accumulating. In terms of the carbon market, I looked today, I think the, the value of CO2, at least in the US, is on a, for a ton is about uh, $20, $30, that might even be high. I don't know. Much lower, like 10 or? Even less. 
even less. Yeah, so, well, so you could see at this rate, if we're accumulating um, three tons per hectare per year, we'd be making less than $100 a hectare. It's no way is it gonna pay anything close to our restoration costs, but if we're doing large scale projects and if the price of carbon starts to go up, then it, then it might have some significant benefits. Um, in terms of thinking about carbon across ecosystems, as I said, salt marshes around 100 or even 200 grams of carbon per square meter per year in some systems are significantly more, even though forests are, are growing a lot, the, the turnover is more rapid. So these systems are, are really um, significant. They're very effective. We're not gonna get enough money out of them to, to pay for restoration, but maybe it could help to subsidize or reduce costs, especially into the future. And without that information, we wouldn't, we wouldn't you know, we, we, we need that scientific information to provide the policy. And then the last thing I'll, I'll show you some slides about is the idea of public support. If we're gonna do this, there needs to be funding, there needs to be public support. So one, one last example of a marsh restoration project in San Francisco Bay um, that is right here, here's the Golden Gate and here's the downtown San Francisco. Chrissy Field is a, um, a very small restoration project, nothing on the scale of the salt ponds, but something that received, has received an enormous amount of attention in San Francisco. It was, it's called um, Chrissy Field. Well, it, it historically was a lagoon, a, a small lagoon, probably about 50 hectares in size, um, right on San Francisco Bay. It was filled following the 1906 earthquake. All of the debris from the, 19, the buildings and the, we had an enormous earthquake in San Francisco in 1906, and they, they filled in the lagoon with debris um, from that. And then they built a, a, um, a military airport or a landing field. Chrissy Field, it's called after one of, the air, one of the airmen there. And it was an airfield through the 90s when um, the U.S. shut a lot of army bases in the 1990s because of funding issues. And so the, 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 air, the whole um, army base there that's called the Presidio was turned over to the Park Service. When the Park Service got it, they started thinking about how do we improve the area and how do we manage it. And one of the first things they thought about was the historic lagoon that used to be there and the need for restoration within the bay. So they did this, they, they set up this restoration. As I said, it's pretty small. It has a number of challenging issues in part because of how small it is. But it provides a lot of benefits. There's, um, there is, relatively good vegetation growth around the edge of the lagoon. There's significant bird use. There's over 110 or 120 of bird species that use the lagoon. Even though it's very small, there's actually significant fish use as well. So it does provide a lot of benefits. <clears throat> like I said, there are a number of problems associated with the size and maintaining it. Primarily, it fills in with sand. And, um, and so it gets cut off from the tides much more regularly than anyone thought. But I would say that it's probably the most visited lagoon, or visited wetland in all of San Francisco because of its location. And also because they did an enormous effort at public education and outreach. So all kinds of classes come out and visit the lagoon. It's not always this crowded. This was one of the opening day ceremonies, but it's often this crowded. There's, I, I take classes there probably two or three times a year. And constantly there's dog walkers, joggers, bikers, just a nonstop stream of people going by the site. And they've made a huge effort to get the public involved, not just go by the site, but to come out and plant plants and weed and do bird surveys. Um, so they've made an enormous effort. This little symbol, Help Grow Chrissy Field, um, was used all over buses and all over um, public places around the city in the early 90s, uh, or the mid 90s when they were raising money and starting to do this, to make people aware of the project. So it's really a, a good example of public awareness. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of this example of Chrissy Field, I think it really illustrates how valuable it is to get the public involved. If we don't have public support for restoration, there won't be long-term funding and it's not gonna go forward. So we need to engage the public, at, just like was done at Chrissy Field, school groups, Business volunteer, businesses, uh, w recruited volunteers, all kinds of 
uh, ways. And also its location was super valuable in terms of how, high, how many people see it. So some high profile projects like that that are really visible, I think, are super useful in gaining public support. And then reaching out to the wide range of groups of people, not just scientists and ecologists and bird watchers, is really useful because in the end, if we need a broad range of public support to move forward. So then to conclude, I think um, in terms of climate change and some of the issues there, the sooner we start to really restore tidal wetlands, the better, the more resilient they will be and the more um, likely they are to do well with future climate change. Incorporating science and using this idea of adaptive management on individual projects like was done at the salt ponds and hopefully on bigger scale projects is um, really super useful, although that large scale issue certainly is more of a challenge. And then getting the public involved, whether it's through education or coming out and planting and doing things like that um, is also super valuable. And then I will acknowledge all the people who um, supported the project and thank again VIU for asking me to come and talk, and I really enjoyed interacting with the students that, through the other class and going out in the field, so thank you very much.